Welcome to Hear God Every Day. I'm your host, Sarah Witten. Get comfortable, open your heart, and let's talk about how we can be more sensitive to God's voice in our everyday life. Welcome back. Thanks for investing your time here. Um, You know, really the heart behind this podcast is to, with each episode, better sharpen and connect us to the skill of just hearing God's voice and picking up on those things that he's saying in the busyness and in the noise of our everyday life. And um, as I was praying about what God wanted to share in this episode, I was kind of surprised because he said worship. And uh, he wanted to talk about how worship is connected with hearing him. And at first, you know, my first response was, Thinking, my thinking about worship is usually a pouring out, a, you know, me just kind of like lavishing love and praise on the Lord, which isn't wrong. But what a different framework to think of worship as it's connected with hearing the Lord. And then, you know, as I was kind of just digging into scripture and the word and, um, you know, just hearing from God on on what exactly worship is and um, its intent. There is no better way, I'm convinced now, uh, to hear from God than a really good worship session. And so we're going to talk about not only the applications of worship, but by the end of this podcast, we're going to cover um, eight things that you can um, ask or do during your worship session to totally revamp your worship and really connect you to hearing the Lord. So um, before we dive in, I'm going to pray. God, thank you so much for, for worship, for just this exchange and this relational encounter we have with you in worship. And we just pray that in this time that you open our eyes and our hearts Um, to worship you in spirit and in truth, God, to grasp what that means, but then to be able to just implement it in our everyday lives and to not feel like we have to do these hour-long, deep worship sessions. And if we have time for that and if our schedule allows, then that's amazing. And God, there are times where we just have to drop everything and say, I'm just clearing this whole day to worship you. But there are other times, God, where you have us busy doing things and it's for a good purpose. We may have, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And God, I just pray that you teach us those hacks and how to, how to worship you in spirit and in truth in whatever time we have each day that we get from you, God, that we wouldn't miss this profound connection. And so, um, Lord, just speak through me, uh, use this time, God, for your will. And, um, we just thank you in advance for all that you're doing. And we ask this in the name of your precious son, Jesus. Amen. Um, so this topic of worship really caught my attention because there is this aspect to it that it is just nourishment and health to our bodies and souls. I mean, literally Exodus 20 through 25 says, worship the Lord, worship the Lord and his blessing will be on your food and water. I will take away sickness from among you. There are so many breakthroughs that are locked in worship. Um, and actually when we dig into uh, this word for worship, um, it means to personally esteem or to hold something or someone in high respect, to show reverence or awe, veneration of someone who is devout. And when we're talking about worshiping, we can worship God, but we can also worship lesser things in our life. And, you know, obviously the Bible is full of warnings against doing this. And um, the first thing that we need to look at when we're engaging in worship is what are we really worshiping in spirit and in truth? Like our minds, our feelings, our thoughts, what are they really worshiping? And worshiping is venerating. And when you look up venerate, it means to have ritual acts of devotion. Okay. So pause right there. Ritual acts of devotion. Think about if I am 
worshiping the Lord and thanking and praising him for my breakthrough and saying, you know, Lord, only you have the power to make this happen. Yet throughout the day, I'm doing these quote unquote ritual acts of devotion. So let's say, you know, I'm leaning on, um, my health supplements or I'm leaning on, um, my putting in a a 12 hour work day to really just, you know, have this breakthrough at work, whatever that ritual act of devotion is, we can often do those ritual acts unto things that are not the Lord. I mean, even worrying is a ritual act of devotion. You are habitually doing something with your thoughts that is not worshiping and honoring God. It's actually honoring our own thought processes and our ability to figure it out, right? The other definition of venerate that caught my eye was admiring deference. So through your admiration and because of your admiration of this thing, you defer to it. And deference, I mean, when we're talking about deferring our decisions, deferring our emotions, deferring um, those things that really sway us and guide us, we really need to pay attention to what we are venerating, to what we're worshiping. What do you admire so much? Or what do you, said a different way, what do you place your hope in so much that you end up deferring a lot of decisions to it? Do you defer to Google for most of your decisions? You know, just these little things that um, in our everyday life we don't really think of as worship, but they can be worship. And the point of this is not really to get legalistic into what's okay and what's not okay. It's, you know, it's fine to use Google. It's okay to um, take vitamins. In fact, you know, a lot of those things can be helpful and can be tools from the Lord. But um, really what I'm getting at is the heart behind what we're doing when we use things in this world, whether it's people, whether it's tools, um, our heart can't be that this thing will save us or this thing will guide us or this thing will dictate our decisions. Our heart must be that God will save us and guide us and dictate our decisions. And anything else that he wants to use as a tool on that path is awesome. So worship, first and foremost, is both an attitude and an act. Okay, so we're going to talk about both of those. It's an attitude because we are told we need to worship in spirit and in truth. What that tells us is that that right there, that's our link to worship and hearing God every day. That worshiping not attached to a truth is not really true worship. So there is this necessary link between truth and the word of God. Um, Psalm 86, 11 says, teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear in that that word fear also means worship your name. So what that verse alone says is that worship requires a heart that is undivided, meaning we're not kind of dividing our devotion between God and and this other idol that we have, but undivided heart that is literally walking in the truth and in the way that God has taught us. And we don't have the truth or the way that God has taught us without his word, without hearing from him. And so the whole attitude of worship is inextricably linked to hearing from God. Um, Also, in terms of attitude, worship is rooted in the knowledge of and obedience to the revealed word of God. Wow. I'm going to read that again. So it's rooted in the knowledge of and obedience to the revealed word of God. So God's revealing a word to us. And part of that interaction, that exchange of worship is having the word of God revealed to us. And then in response, 
being rooted in that knowledge, not just letting that, you know, seed be eaten, but letting it take root and then having it birth in obedience in us in growing something. It's this exchange. It produces a growth. Worship is created to produce a growth in us. Um, there's this, this danger that we fall into, um, when we take elements of, you know, religion or elements of maybe the way the world does things or the way the world operates and kind of assimilate them into the process of worship. So for example, thinking like, okay, well, the way of the world is I give you this, you give me this. It's a exchange. It is, you know, there's very rarely something for nothing. And, um, God is the God of grace. And so he doesn't always operate like that. But yet when we approach worship as, okay, I have to give something to get something or that if I give this thing, then God owes me this thing, then we are imposing a false system on our worship. And, you know, the word tells us we cannot serve God in money right? That's a great example of this, of when we assimilate the way that we think about, you know, the marketplace or, or currency of, you know, I'm going to pay you this and you're going to give me that, or you have paid me this, therefore I owe you this. Um, that's not love. That's not love. And uh, we need that undivided heart for that right attitude of worship. Um, Because when we formulate our worship, um, as Isaiah 29, 13 says, um, on godless rules formulated by human teachers, that's when it becomes hypocrisy. You know, and none of us really think of ourselves as hypocrites. Um, But if we are basing our worship on a set of rules, that is not rules, you know, based on the word. This is rules based on, you know, kind of a more pharisaical take, our, our human, um, our human ways and our human knowledge and wisdom that's kind of imposed on worship. Um, God calls it godless. And you can't have true worship without God. So okay, we've got to have that attitude. But then the second thing is that action right? So worship is attitude and it's action. This is the part that really opened my eyes because like I said, you know, um, worship, especially soaking, you know, nowadays we're just, we're very into soaking. It doesn't seem very active, but there's so much going on. Okay. So the beautiful thing is I was digging into kind of the the Hebrew context for worship. So like back in, um, you know, Hebrew culture, what was worship like? What was the goal of worship? What did it incorporate? And also looking through the Bible, like, you know, where was worship incorporated and for what purpose? And the, the awesome thing was literally the basis for Hebrew worship was the activity of God in human history. Okay, so let me like tweak that a little bit to apply it to us. So the basis for our worship then is the activity of God in our history. Think about your history for a moment. Where have you seen the activity of God? And that is your foundation of worship. That's where we start. We start with that thanks and praise, that thank you, God, for all that you have done in my life because I remember what you've done. Um, In Hebrew culture, they also acknowledge the interrelatedness of both the, the physical and kind of the supernatural, spiritual. You know, there was the natural and, and then the supernatural. And they didn't have this idea that we do today of sacred things versus secular things. Like it's sacred when I'm going to church, it's secular when I'm going to the grocery store. Um, But like work, play, worship, were all sacred. And because of that, they were all acts of worship. And 
you know, we like to compartmentalize ourselves these days in a way that's really not healthy. I think God's actually doing a, a big work to kind of integrate us back together, integrating the parts of you, integrating us as a body back together in unity. Um, because when when we are integrated and we just as our whole person, not like, oh, this is the work side of me, this is the you know school side of me, this is whatever, but us as a whole person are responding to God in worship through everything we're doing in the day. And that doesn't mean that you're making everything you do hyper-spiritual. It means you're seeing what you do every day through the lens of worship. And that releases us to worship God with our minds, with our emotions, with our personality, with our body, with every part of us. And we see that modeled for us in the Word. So, In the Bible, worship was first and foremost the expression of praise and thanksgiving. And, you know, that's kind of what I just talked about, how that is our foundation. And for the Hebrews, this was built on the visible or auditory manifestation of God to human beings. Okay, so to kind of summarize that, worship was praise and thanksgiving for the visions that God had given them for the ways that he had visibly shown up in their life, but also for the words that he had spoken to to them prophetically, also in his word, the, the visible and what they had heard. Expression of praise or thanksgiving for what they had seen and what they had heard. Now you read that and you tell me that worship is not connected to hearing God. Like, I'm telling you, as I dove into this, I was like, wow, I can't believe I didn't realize how central worship was to this. Okay, the second way that it shows up in the Bible is it's the act of obedience to some divine directive. Did you know that your obedience is worship? Your obedience, however big or small, is worship. So like Abram obeying the command of God to, you know, sojourning Canaan and um, every time that people in the Old Testament would build an altar, like that was kind of this physical act that you could see. Sometimes our acts of obedience, actually quite often our acts of obedience may not be visible. We may not have, have an altar built at the end of it that we can show for it, but yet because we acted in obedience, that is worship to God. Um, other acts of obedience that showed up as worship, you know, when you're looking up instances of worship in the Bible were animal sacrifices, which because Christ was the sacrifice for us once and for all for these, or for us, these animal sacrifices would more take the form of any kind of sacrifices. You know, has God ever asked you to lay something down and trust him? Because I promise you, if he hasn't yet, he's going to. It's something that's very common to all of us. But those sacrifices are an act of worship. Okay, other things that were done as worship. They erected stone pillars. Again, like building these big memorials. We may not build, build memorials to what God does in our life, but I sure journal it. I sure write down answered prayer. God did this or I write a post about it, or I share a testimony in a book. Um, All of these are spiritually erecting stone pillars. What have you uh, built into your life that is just this um, testament of thanksgiving for what God has done or a sharing of testimony because that is worship? Another thing they did was taking vows in response to divine revelation. So has God given you a revelation? Has God given you clarity or a calling or a word or a directive during a time of worship? That time in our heart where we are responding and we're saying, yes, Lord, let your yeses be yeses and your noes be noes. When we're saying, yes, Lord, or no, Lord, I won't do that anymore. Whatever we are responding with in our heart, that's the vows that we are making. Worship was also um, done through purification, through circumcision. Um, nowadays, that's more of like that that 
confession and repentance time where we're coming to the Lord and we're saying, man, God, like I'm struggling with this. Please help purify me of this. Um, where we are repenting, where we're turning and changing based on the guidance and the correction and the, the uh, discipline and teaching we're getting from the Lord. And just like circumcision is a cutting off, what are we cutting off in our life as an act of worship? Worship also occurred as prayers of praise and thanksgiving, as petition and intercession. So that's a whole nother realm. As part of your worship, how often do you ask for things? You know, I think of worship as thanking God and pouring out that love and adoration. And, you know, occasionally like you receive a vision in worship or you get a word in worship. But very rarely do I think of as an act of worship, recalling the petitions that I have, the things that I want to ask God for, and that asking God for things is an act of worship. Like, wow, mind blown. But it's true because if we're asking God for things, we are worshiping because we are seeing Him as our source. Whereas if we're not asking Him for things, what are we seeing as our source? Are we saying, no, I'll handle that. It's okay. I don't want to ask for that. Don't want to burden God with that. I'll just do it myself. We're worshiping ourselves. then in that case. So asking God for things and intercessing for others. That worship is not just about us and our one-on-one experience with God. And actually, I'm going to say more about that in a minute, but that it is also about interceding for others. So going deeper into that, as I was looking more into kind of the Hebrew way of life, they had three types of worship for the Hebrews. They had private worship, which this is like the, you know, lock yourself in your room and just worship you and the Lord. Nobody else can see. It's only for you and God. But then they also had family worship where they would worship together as a family. Wow. I mean, how many of us are missing that piece? And maybe it's not biological family, but that small, tight-knit group of people that you're meeting with and worshiping with. And worship doesn't have to look like traditional worship because remember in Acts, the disciples and apostles, they worshiped by meeting together in their homes and breaking bread and uh, teaching and worshiping and reviewing um, the words that the Lord had spoken. Worship can take a lot of different forms. And then also the corporate or public worship. So more of, you know, the the church kind of big meeting settings that we think of. And these family worships and corporate worships were a complement to their private worships. They weren't a replacement for it. And I think sometimes we get into seasons where we are worshiping the Lord very faithfully privately, but we're not really engaging with others in our worship. Because I'm not talking about engaging with others as in you show up in the pew and you sing with others. I'm talking about engaging in worship in some of these other ways, in the ways of um, of confession and repentance, in the ways of purification, in the ways of uh, getting revelation and uh, sharing testimony and thanking God, um, all of these things. Sometimes we get into a place where we're not doing them corporately or as a family. Or the reverse may be true. Sometimes we really are engaging um, in family worship, small group worship, corporate worship. But when was the last time that we, you know, just sat in our car for an extra 30 minutes and just poured out to the Lord one on one? So here are eight things that God's put together that. Literally what I wrote down was revamping your worship to hear from God. Okay, if you want to revamp your worship to hear from God this week, set aside some time and here are the eight things. I'm going to have these up on the show notes page at charismapodcastnetwork.com slash shows. You can search for Hear God Every Day or Sarah Witten um, and they'll be up there. But jot these down, take them to the Lord and really experience a full, well-rounded worship. I'm going to do the same thing before we come back together next week. Um, 
And I would love to hear how yours goes. So send me a text, send me an email. There's ways to do both at uh, arrowsofzion.com, but I do want to hear about it. Okay. Revamping your worship to hear from God. Number one, what do your thoughts, feelings, and actions show that you're holding reverence for? This is that kind of examination of the heart where we're looking at our thoughts, feelings, and actions and seeing, am I worshiping God and holding him in the highest esteem? Or is there still little pieces that are divided among other idols in my life? Am I still leaning on other things? Number two, what truth or knowledge do you, God, want to reveal to me that I can center this worship around? Like, how would it change our worship if we started with a word of knowledge, saying, God, what truth or knowledge do you want to reveal to me? And then centering that worship session around that. Okay, number three, what act of obedience can I offer as worship? I just said act because what if we just had one little thing, one little thing that God told us that was a act of obedience or a little sacrifice or something that we could add as worship to the Lord. I mean, it's just going to bring our worship up that much more, another level. Number four, how am I transposing other religion or worldly ways onto how I worship you? How are you mixing ideas, maybe from your childhood, maybe from um, things that you've learned in the world, maybe through um, the way other systems work? What have you transposed onto God and onto worship that's actually not true? Number five, open my eyes to an everyday secular, quote unquote, secular, I have it in quotes, part of my life that's actually a sacred worship to you. Maybe God's going to tell you, hey, that ride to pick up your kids at school. That's an act of worship to me. And again, it's not taking these things and figuring out how we can make them more holy feeling and do different things with them. It's literally recognizing ways that our life is already worship to the Lord. And because we recognize them as such, doing them with a different attitude and um, a little bit of a, a different stance towards them. Number six, I want to thank you and praise you for blank. No worship is complete without thanks and praise. And so, you know, a lot of times in the morning when I'm starting my time with God, the first thing I do before I do anything else is I make a list of things that I'm uh, thanking and praising God for. It just like opens up the floodgates for everything else. It opens up your heart to see God's goodness and to say, oh yeah, this is that good God. I, I can be safe with him. I can reveal all these other things to him. Just sets the stage for intimacy. Number seven, I want you to help purify or prune me from blank. Maybe it's anxiety. Maybe it's, um, I don't know, a sin you're struggling with. Maybe it's boundaries that need to be reset in your life, but I want you to help purify or prune me from blank. And then last, show me a vision of private, family, or corporate worship that you want me involved in. You know, I said sometimes we lose sight of one of the three or of multiple. Or sometimes we're doing all of them, but God just wants to kick it up to that next level. But let God give you a vision for one or two or all of these areas. How can you be more fully engaged in worship in those places? So that's what we're going to do together this week. And next week, we're going to talk a little bit about how it went and uh, dive into what God has for us next. So um, thanks so much for spending this time with me. And I just pray that it just ripples out into blessing your time with the Lord this week. Thanks for spending time with me today. If God spoke to you through this time, visit arrowsofzion.com 
for writings, resources, and ways to partner with me in reaching the unreached with the gospel. You can also find Arrows of Zion on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. Have a blessed day, and let's meet here next week.